Hello and welcome to another critical care teaching video. Today we're going to look at prognostication following cardiac arrest for our ICU patients. First of all, we'll take a look at the problem we face when trying to prognosticate, and then we'll look at various methods of prognostication and the timing at which those methods can be applied. How do we identify the patients that are likely to have a poor outcome following cardiac arrest in a timely and most importantly, accurate manner? So what is a poor outcome? Well, most trials that have looked at outcome following neurological insults have used the Glasgow Outcome Score or GOS. This was first described back in 1975 and looks at objective recovery following any insult to the brain. The Glasgow Outcome Score rates outcome on a scale of 1 to 5. 1, 2 and 3 are rated as poor outcomes, whereas 4 and 5 in most trials are considered to be reasonably good outcomes. Clearly, dying is a poor outcome, as is being left in a vegetative state, scores 1 and 2. Severe disability is somebody who's needing help with activities of daily living, like washing, dressing, feeding, cleaning themselves. Moderate disability, these patients are independent, but perhaps have not been able to get back to all their previous activities, such as work or social lives. And number five, a good recovery. These people do not have any residual deficits or the deficits are so very minor that they do not affect their daily life. Our patients can't speak for themselves. And therefore, we rely on previously expressed wishes and the family to aid in decision making about what a good and bad outcome for a specific patient is. While living wills and advanced directives can be very helpful, they're still not commonplace and not very many families yet have got lasting power of attorney for medical decisions. Some families will have discussed these issues, but in my experience, many have not. And this puts enormous pressure on families at a time of enormous stress and requires very careful exploration by experienced members of the critical care team. Consider the following two patients then, a totally independent elite athlete and the second patient, a frail comorbid person who is on the verge of needing help with basic activities of daily living. The predicted outcome following a certain neurological insult is disability and the need for help in washing and dressing. These two people have very different changes in quality of life ahead of them. The frail and comorbid person was heading for this anyway and may see a decrease in ability to needing help with ADLs as fairly minor and totally acceptable. But for a totally independent elite athlete that is a huge change and may not be acceptable to them. In terms of prognosticating after cardiac arrest then, within those first 24 hours, this is, contrary to popular belief, possible in certain isolated circumstances. These include a, cr a clear, irreversible pathology at work, such as a catastrophic injury to the brain from which there is no possibility of survival, or indeed the natural progression of a known chronic end-stage cardiac or respiratory disease for which transplant is not an option in that patient's case. Under these circumstances, we can take the decision that they're not going to do well neurologically within those first 24 hours, and it may be appropriate to withdraw life-sustaining therapy at that point. It is also common to have neuroimaging within the first 24 hours for patients who have suffered a cardiac arrest. Complete loss of grey-white differentiation on CT is a sign of severe anoxic brain injury. Compare the two scans in front of you. The one on the left is a relatively normal brain where you can clearly see the difference between gray and white matter. Whereas on the right, there is complete loss of gray white differentiation. There is also sarcal effacement indicating the brain is starting to swell as well. However, neuroimaging on its own should not be relied upon to make a decision about whether or not to continue caring for a patient, even if you do think they've got a severe brain injury it's important to take the entire picture together, the clinical assessment and our best estimates of what would be an acceptable outcome for that patient are vital decision-making tools.
It is very common for families to ask very soon after arrival on critical care, what are my relatives' chances? How are they going to do? It is possible to make some assessment of this after you've achieved some cardiorespiratory stability using the Pittsburgh cardiac arrest categories. If you find your patient is awake or localising to the tube, there is an 80% chance of survival with a good neurological outcome. If your patient's comatose but is not suffering any shock or severe respiratory failure, that number falls to 60%. Comatose with shock, which they define as more than 0.1 mics per kilo per minute of noradrenaline or adrenaline by infusion, the chance of a good neurological outcome falls quite dramatically to just 30%. Whereas if, after achieving cardiorespiratory stability following an arrest, your patient is comatose with no gag, cough or pupillary light reflexes, the chances are just 10%. While those numbers are useful, they don't tell you exactly what's going to happen to the patient in front of you. Even if your patient is in that category four with a 10% chance of survival, with a good neurological outcome, you can't tell whether or not they're in that 90% group who are gonna do badly, or they're in that one in 10 who's gonna have a good outcome. Over the first couple of days, neurophysiological testing can be of use. EEG, looking for the absence of normal background wave activity is a sign of poor neurological outcome. And that's a very sensitive sign of poor neurological outcome. In studies, it's been well in excess of 95%. Burst suppression is something that's often reported following cardiac arrest, but is not considered to be a useful sign for prognostication. Evoked potentials can also be used, typically around day three to five. Loss of the M20 spike in response to stimulation of the median nerve is associated with a more than 99% chance of a very poor neurological outcome. However, not all hospitals have access to on-demand neuro neurophysiological testing, and very few will have access to on-demand um, evoked potential testing, especially in a busy intensive care unit. So although very useful, not necessarily applicable to all of our patients. Neuroimaging is certainly something that we do rely on to help complete the picture when making decisions about patients with families. But be very careful what you ask for. Most radiologists will not conduct a CT or MRI scan when your request is for prognostication. My own practice, I ask for CTs and MRIs to help explain this clinical picture I have in front of me. Can the radiologist identify a structural cause for the comatose patient I find in front of me? Abnormality of deep brain structures such as the basal ganglia and brainstem do predict long-term significant disability for fairly obvious reasons. Blood tests may also become increasingly useful in the future. Neurofilament light chain is a neuronal cytoplasmic protein which is expressed in large caliber myelinated axons. The levels increase in the blood and CSF in reaction to a wide variety of neurological insults. And there are currently studies ongoing looking at neurofilament light chain levels in the diagnosis of and prognostication following a neurological injury. The exact timings for these tests and the threshold levels for testing are currently under investigation. Ultimately, time is one of the most powerful prognostic tools available to us. A patient not waking up on day two following a cardiac arrest is very different from a patient not waking up on day 10. However, as families watch us, watch their relatives, it can be very hard for them and needs very careful and sensitive explanation as to why we are seemingly not doing anything to try and improve outcome. A few final thoughts then. While many of the methods described so far may be of use in predicting outcome in a population of cardiac arrest patients, none are 100% sensitive and specific for the patient that you have in front of you at the bedside. I would recommend that when making prognostic decisions, you should do this on the basis of serial clinical assessment over several days with some neuroimaging and or neurophysiology testing in select cases and with careful and sensitive exploration of the 
family's perception of the patient's wishes. Thank you very much for listening. If you do have any questions or comments, please leave them down below and I hope to see you on the next video.